We'll start with developing news that we've been following. A one-year-old child in currently in critical condition after she was hit by a car just outside of a store on South Flores. San Antonio police say the child's mother was having some sort of a, quote, disturbance, end quote, while the child was in the car. We're not sure exactly what that means. It's the wording of the police department. The child then got out of the car, was hit by another vehicle. Again, this is a one-year-old. We're told charges are not expected against the other driver since they did stop to help. The Bear County District Attorney Joe Gonzalez today pushing back on complaints within his office, telling commissioner's court that low pay is the main reason his employees are leaving. The remarks come a little more than a week after case that investigates exposed grievances from departing staffers in the DA's office. Now, some are saying that the office has a hostile and a toxic work environment. Others claimed harassment and also a lack of guidance from his administration. And today, the DA responded. Dylan Collier breaks that down. There has been an unfair uh, news account that happened about a week ago that I need to address. Joined by a large group of his employees, Bear County District Attorney Joe Gonzalez made it quite clear that he was not a fan of last week's expose from us. In publicly available exit interviews obtained by KSAT Investigates, staff members who recently departed the agency wrote about retaliation and a lack of leadership. A paid intern from Intake compared harassment endured by women in the office to what he'd witnessed during his time in the military. Gonzalez said the story gave the incorrect impression that there are major management issues and that the primary reason employees are resigning is due to low pay and high caseloads. That does not mean that they have to accept what they do and how they work for less pay compared to other district attorney officers in the state. Gonzalez has so far not sat down with KSAT to discuss the exit interviews, but is scheduled to do so later this week. I'm not planning on going nowhere. Tuesday's remarks before commissioners had shades of now convicted felon Michelle Barrientes Vela's 2019 appearance at the same podium. It followed a string of KSAT investigations into the inner workings of her office. And while Barrientes Vela was ejected from her elected position months later, Gonzalez's comments appeared to be received by a captivated audience, as commissioners said they will now move to address pay issues within his staff. DA Gonzalez said he will have further discussions with county leaders on staffer salary concerns in the coming weeks. He did concede during his remarks that he had not personally reviewed the exit interview forms filled out by departing employees. Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. In other news tonight, a woman is in custody after allegedly stabbing a man during a fight. San Antonio police arrested 29-year-old Evelyn Monsive. That incident happened just before 10 o'clock last night in the 8100 block of Golden Harvest on the west side. SAPD says that Monsive and the man got into a fight when she stabbed him in the back and then cut him several times on the arms. She's charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. The man, by the way, was taken to a nearby hospital and he is expected to recover. Right now, Castle Hills police investigating after a woman crashes her car into a wall overnight. According to police, an officer tried to stop that car that was driving along 410 just before 4 this morning. Then the car sped away. Officers were able to catch up to the driver after she crashed into the wall of a turnaround near Airport Boulevard in 281. Police arrested the driver on suspicion of DWI. The police department has not released the name of the woman or the charges she may face. After six days, prosecutors in a capital murder case presented damaging evidence. Jimmy Tran is accused of a 2019 robbery and murder of a 22 year old man. Erica Hernandez takes us inside the courtroom as the jury saw cell phone records from Tran's phone. This second, this One incriminating text message. Dog, I got in a crazy shooting earlier. I need to lay low somewhere where I can stay at your spot. After another. You know anyone who would buy this AR pistol I got for 700? Were read to the jury by an SAPD digital forensic detective that were extracted from Jimmy Tran's phone. Tran on trial for the 2019 robbery and murder of Andres Salinas behind a northeast side wing stop. Detective Justin Knox revealed the messages sent from Tran's phone. They revealed what appears to be Tran texting several people, telling them he was involved in a shooting and needed to get out of San Antonio. Also, it appears he tried selling his AR 
but instead told someone to hold it for him until sold and even implying it had been used to kill someone. Hey GM, my friend, I need you to do me a favor later on today. Can you please set an alarm for 10 a.m. today so I can drop the 223 off to you and I'll pick it back up later. Thank you and be aware it has gained one body, so please be very careful with it, please. Thank you. All of the texts were made just hours after Salinas was murdered. Now it looks like this trial is coming to an end tomorrow. Closing arguments are expected, and if found guilty, Tran would automatically be sentenced to life in prison without parole. At the Kathleen Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Another news now, fair warning, you may be shocked when you get mail from the Bear Appraisal District this week because property values are up, way up, some by 15%. That's about the average increase for Bear County. Teresa Garces has lived here more than 20 years and says that developers have actually been changing her modest neighborhood. They look like medium priced homes, but they're not. They're selling well, almost tripled the amount that the people paid for. Them. So that's a really important point that she made because home sale prices are actually what the appraisal district follows to set the values. And that number helps to determine how much you at the end pay in property taxes. Now, if you disagree with those numbers, you can file a protest. The appraisal district even encourages it. That form is on the back of the notice that you're going to get in the mail. You can also do the entire appeal process online, but you have until May 15th to file it. It sounds customers have some questions. It's about a fee that just started showing up on their bills this month. So KSAT looked into it. It's called the Uplift Assistance Program Fee, and many are wondering what that fund is and where the money's going. Ann Hayden with SAWS says City Council voted on that fee last November, and the Rates Advisory Committee asked for the charge to be broken out into a separate fee on customers' bills. The SAWS Board and City Council also overhauled how its customers pay for water and sewer services. This fund goes toward helping low-income families pay their bills doesn't affect the bottom line of your bill at all. It's about 32 cents per thousand gallons. And so most people will see a very small amount, $1.50 or so. Now Hayden says customers cannot opt out of the fee because it was approved by the board and council as part of SAW's new rate structure. She added it goes directly to the fund and does not pay for any SAW's salaries. It's a problem one woman says is taking a toll on her sleep and her overall well-being. Now she's trying to address the noise that's coming from her next door neighbor, who she says transformed his home into a church. Our Jonathan Cotto spoke with the Northwest Side residents who says she's had it with the noise. My stomach hurts. It makes me angry that I have to live here. This is my sanctuary and that is just it's unacceptable. I really wish something would be done. Patricia Verduzco says she's lived peacefully in her home for the last 30 years, but she says the last two months have been a nightmare. The culprit? The sound of church bells coming from this speaker system she says was installed in February. So that's what I've been going through is like him playing the speaker Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday three times a day, Monday through Friday, five times a day, Saturday and Sunday. The problem I have with him is that this sound is coming directly into my home and you know, it's waking me up every single day. It started off as a home has slowly transformed over the years into what appears to be a Catholic church. We reached out to the Archdiocese of San Antonio who says the church is not recognized by the Archdiocese of San Antonio. We spoke to the church owner who did not want to go on camera, but was aware we were recording he says they are affiliated with a church from Brazil. And we, Pope John Paul II, sanctioned churches to be built within the United States from Brazil. According to the city of San Antonio, a church is allowed in residential areas and are subject to each district's development standards. They cannot control what we do. No one can. The government can't. The city can't. No one can. We are a valid church. But for Patricia, the problem isn't religion. And you see it and it's a church and you respect that, you know, so you don't do anything about it. But with this speaker, it's just a little, a little too much for me. We asked the church leader if he was willing to meet his neighbors halfway in addressing the matter. He says they have two options. Don't like the noise, buy us out. 
Otherwise, it's just the hell up. We've reached out to SAPD to learn what effort has been made to identify the church bells as a possible noise nuisance. We did see officers outside of the church performing measurements of sound pressure levels. We have yet to receive a reply. Reporting Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. We have an update though. SAPD just got back to us and says they did two separate decibel readings today and no violations were found. None. The church was notified that decibel readings will be done in the future to assure the church stays in compliance with noise ordinances. Take a live cam out there. 86 degrees. A little overcast, but today wasn't that bad. No, you know, uh, the, the clouds actually kept the temperature down a little bit, so we didn't reach into the lower 90s for a high temperature, at least not in San Antonio. Officially, 87 are high, still well above average of 78, but get ready for a big time temperature drop to come in just a few days. I mean, tomorrow you'll you'll notice it, but more so Thursday and Friday. 89 in Hondo now, 88 Stinson, 80 Canyon Lake, 87 New Braunfels, feeling the warmth out there. And as we go through the evening hours, a bit breezy with that southeasterly wind off the Gulf of Mexico, so humid, warm as well, mostly cloudy, but this starts to change tomorrow with a cold front. We'll talk about the effects of that cold front on temperatures because there's going to be big time temperature whiplash have a jacket ready and very good rain chances. We'll talk about how much we could get and when in just a bit. All right, thank you, Adam. And now we're gonna go back out live to give you an idea of the traffic situation right now. This is uh, 281 at Loop 410 and you can see right there that ramp. Ooh, yeah, looking like back to back traffic right now. I mean, it's flowing, but it's just a little slow going, which is to be expected at 610 in the evening. So just be sure to Check at your ways or your Google travel apps just to make sure that you get home in time. Still ahead on the news at six, a big painting with a big impact. That's the hope anyway. How a painting of Mission Espada is going to help other missions in San Antonio stay in good condition. All right, here's a look at what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. The painful images of yet another school shooting, this time in Nashville. They're still fresh on the minds of many Americans. Now here in Texas, families of the Robb Elementary School shooting are throwing their support behind bills to prevent more school shootings from happening. Now, another news tonight, one of the San Antonio missions is being seen in a brand new light, and that is because a local artist is capturing the magic Mission Espada to restore and preserve it. Ursula Perry with a look at this landmark like you have never seen before, very colorful, and how the result will help keep these historic churches for years to come. Today is like the initial thing, you know, like kind of the heat, the sky, like the feeling of it, and so I'll paint on it today like this and just kind of feel the thing till about 1130. Throw it back in the truck, let it dry. Tomorrow I'll, I may come out again, but I doubt it. And that is how Rex Hausman, one of the city's most successful artists, rolls out his paint. Everything about Hausman is big. His canvases, which he calls hunting blinds, his paintbrush, his view of the world, and his talent and devotion to God. I came out here on Tuesday and just sat and prayed and you know, thought about things and gave some things to God in a good way. You know, just giving thanks for all this. His paintings have been lauded across the world. He is shown in New York and London and even under the Vatican, among other places. This one is going to hang next week at Mission San Jose at the Mission Heritage Partners Gala, which raises money to keep all of our missions in good shape. So this is a very cinematic size. Um, it's kind of tipping the hat to Paul Cezanne and that idea of daily painting and going out to paint um, in Aix-en-Provence every day. And then it being one of the missions, it's very much about being rooted to where you are. This beautiful work of art is gonna be completed at Hausman Millworks over the next week. That's Rex's family's art space in the city. Then it's gonna be auctioned off at Mission San Jose at the gala on April 13th. And that may be the only time you're gonna to get to see it before it's hanging up in someone's living room perhaps, or maybe one day, a museum somewhere in the world. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. All right, we have to talk about what is going to be happening later on this week because we're in for a lot of changes. We don't have to, we want to. We need to. We're no, embracing we need to. what's going we to We're embracing to. what's going to happen. This is Adam. good. This is really good. This is some much needed rain, some drought denting rain on the way. It's not going to wipe away the drought, but these are those baby steps we need to take to 
keep chipping away at it. So our main headlines here turning much cooler the next several days, especially Thursday and Friday. Get into the details in a moment. Much needed rain though is coming with those cooler temperatures and then we're going to clear out by Easter. That's the nice thing as well. I mean, this is going to be affecting Good Friday, but by Easter, I think we'll be just fine and actually pretty comfortable. Look at the temperature drop tomorrow. We're near 80 degrees, 79 for the high temperature by Thursday and Friday. The warmest we'll get is about 60. So think of it this way throughout the day, Thursday and Friday. Most of the time we'll be in the 50s. So fall like back to jacket weather and then we rebound back into the 70s this upcoming weekend. All right, we have a little bit of activity on the radar screen out there right now. One lone thunderstorm decided to pop up near Eagle Pass there in Maverick County. They actually had enough clearing to destabilize the atmosphere enough, get some uh, rising motion going and generate this thunderstorm. And right now it's moving out of Eagle Pass. You see Highway 277 there running west to east and it's moving off to the northeast. This just developed. This is a very fresh new young thunderstorm and you see some development uh, trying to come together uh, across the Rio Grande as well. More development now. This I think is likely to hold together for a while and track off to the northeast. So we'll be watching this for communities such as Uvalde toward Sabinal as well. It, if this does tap into more unstable environment, then it could become strong to severe. So something we'll be watching here going forward just over the next couple of hours. Really, here's the big picture. We have this Flow aloft coming off the Pacific, so a lot of mid and high level clouds with it. Midsection of the country, that's where we have a dynamics system, classic spring system with the snow and blizzard on the cold side of it, but severe thunderstorms on the warm side of it from Wisconsin down through Iowa, Missouri, even into northeastern Texas is where we'll have some severe thunderstorms developing through the evening and into the night tonight. That is as this cold front pushes eastward. We're going to get clipped by that cold front. It's not going to do a whole lot for us in terms of showers and thunderstorms, but we could see a brief storm from it here and there isolated in nature tomorrow morning before sunrise and through the morning commute. But I really want to focus on Thursday. That's when the action is really going to ramp up. We'll start to see the rain, showers, thunderstorms coming and going. So intermittent off and on for your neighborhood, often on Thursday, even through the day on Friday and then tapering off as we get into Saturday morning. So we're looking at two days here of periodic rainfall with some embedded downpours and some cracks of thunder, rumbles of thunder and whatnot, and some lightning strikes and overall accumulations over that few days span. I do think will very likely be one to three inches for most of our area. Higher amounts closer to the Gulf Coast, lesser amounts closer to the Rio Grande. So Del Rio, maybe a half inch or so locally. I think one to two inches is very likely with even some neighborhoods seeing more than that around town. So very widespread rain is what we're expected. 80% coverage Thursday, 70% on Friday, then Saturday morning. We're down to about 20 to 30%. It really starts to taper off at that point. Humid out there right now. Dew points are up. That will be changing tomorrow because of a strong wind. That wind's going to be out of the north at 15 to 25, gusting up to 40. So get ready for a blustery day. You won't notice the mugginess by tomorrow afternoon. It'll be swept away. High temperatures right around 80, give or take. And there you go into Easter. We clear out, dry out, and it's comfortable at 78. I want to clarify something with you, Adam. We're yep. not talking about severe weather, though, over the next few days. No, we're not. We're talking mm. about just good, yeah. much needed rain, really. Yeah, good. That our lawns will very much appreciate. Yeah. All right. Hi, Larry. Hello. All right, so the Spurs playing yep. tonight, and I mean, this team has heart. They're fighting. And that, what, that is what makes them fun to watch, in my yeah. opinion, because they just compete. They don't give up. They haven't won a lot of games, but they just fight, 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 and that's what they're going to do at the Phoenix Suns tonight. And UTSA football is attracting a lot of talent, including plenty of transfers coming up. I know since we've been here together, we've never had a group of kids still so excited to keep practicing. Usually right now they're about done, and I haven't felt that at all from these kids. They're, they're still continuing to want to be here and get better right now. Players that love to practice is a great thing. Coach Trailer approved in Big Board Sports. 
after shocking the Kings Sunday night 142 134 in overtime. The Spurs will look to knock off the Suns tonight. Phoenix is fourth in the Western Conference and winners of five in a row. The Spurs beat Sacramento despite Devin, Jeremy, and Keldon all sitting on the bench in street clothes. Trey Jones, Julian Champagny, Dominic Barlow all had career nights, and Doug McDermott lit up the Kings for 30. The Spurs stepped it up and they kept it going even in overtime. So, what does that say about this team? Every single night, it doesn't matter, you know, who we have in the lineup, we're going to compete at, at, you know, all costs. Um, you know, we got guys that are hungry. Um, guys are trying to prove things every single night, continue to learn, continue to grow. Um, and so every single night we're going to come ready to play. We're going to try to, you know, compete as much as we can, try to do all the things we know how to do the right way and uh, let the rest take care of itself. But, yeah, every, every single night we're going to come out and compete and give it, you know, all we got. Suns will host the Spurs at 9 tonight. First half highlights on the night beat. Spring football is winding down for the UTSA Roadrunners, and a bunch of guys are getting their first taste of the 210 triangle of toughness and the culture pillars. I'm talking about their 2023 signing class, which totals 25 student athletes. That's 13 from the high school ranks and 12 transfers. Running back Rocco Griffin transferred in from Vanderbilt and defensive back Elliot Davison from Incarnate Word. So what's the transition been like for them? Biggest thing was really just a better opportunity for myself, but it was also going to a school where I know I can, I can thrive and I can thrive. So I think that's what really led me here, and they have a great culture. You know, they've been here for two to three years, and it's been a lot of success. The players love it here, so I think it just led me, led me to this location. Coming in initially, I feel like um, my my first job is to you know get the playbook down for myself, but also to um, really just push the room. Um, because, like I said, UTSA has had past success, but you always need people to come in and push you to that next level. Roadrunners are closing in on their spring game Friday, April 14th, 6.30 p.m. at the Alamo Dome. Two weeks ago, we stopped by the University of the Incarnate Word for Cardinals Pro Day. Star players Lindsey Scott Jr. and Taylor Grimes were among the cards on hand going through drills for NFL scouts. Both guys were recently drafted by the Pittsburgh Maulers in the 2023 USFL draft. Now, if Ward gets selected by an NFL team, then he has the right to join them instead of the Maulers. So how does that work? They draft your rights, and um, you're, you're allowed to go through this process. If you make it to an NFL team, then, you know, congratulations. Um, but at the end of the day, if you want to come play for the USFL, they have your rights, and that's the team that you go play for. So um, I think uh, just, uh, this journey's been so long for me, and I feel like after just a tremendous season, you know, I don't want to take my shot to the, at the NFL and, uh, and, you know, see where I land. And uh, um, if things don't work out, then USFL is, is always a, a, a good option as well. So um, just wanted to put all the work in and, and see what happens. Scott passed for more than 4,600 yards and had 71 total touchdowns last season. No matter where he goes, that squad is getting a very talented quarterback. Can he play for the Brahmas this weekend? That's my question. They, <laughs> they need, need some quarterback they help. They need him. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll be right back with our KSAT Q&A after the break. Welcome back. As many of you know, there is a lot going on in San Antonio, so we want to talk about that. Yeah, and who better to talk about it with than the mayor of San Antonio, Ron Nuremberg, joins us. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for joining us. Good uh, evening, all. It seems as if um, those for and against Prop A, it seems like it's it's maybe solidifying a little more uh, on the those who are for it, those who are against it. At least three chambers have come out against Proposition A. The San Antonio Police Officers Association has come out against it. Uh, the Texas Organizing Committee has come out in favor of it. Have you, I know in the past you have not taken a stance on Prop A. Has that changed tonight? Well, I, I will tell you, there is a lot in there. Um, but what troubles me is the lack of consequences for theft up to $750 and, and property damage up to $2,500. That's not pocket change. Uh, Prop A, unfortunately, ignores the victims from small businesses to nonprofits to really any working family who wakes up to a smashed car window. Our carts have been doing great things with diversionary programming, uh, helping low-level offenders avoid jail time. But the structure they need and ensure victims are made whole at the same time. And that leads me to really a second major objection to Prop A. It's trying to solve problems at the wrong level of government. If we want to end mass incarceration, which is a mutual goal, then we need to work at the state and federal level. We can't legalize marijuana at the city. That's clear. As Prop A suggested we can, we just can't do that. 
But voters need to know that our DA and our courts have made great strides in reducing penalties and punitive measures for what in most cases really shouldn't be a crime. Voters also need to know that we've banned chokeholds and no knock warrants in the police manual. And the city council recently passed a resolution supporting women's reproductive rights. But we need to work at the state level in order to get those rights restored. That's why I'm encouraging voters to do their research on Prop A before they go vote and then join me in voting against Prop A. In San Antonio, we don't ignore victims of crime and we have to be honest with voters about the appropriate levels of government to, to get the changes that we see. So just to be clear, you're a no when it comes to supporting right. Prop A as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the reasons, again, uh, the consequences of or the lack of consequences for those low level crimes that ignore the victims of theft and property damage. And again, uh, inappropriate level of government to be seeking the changes that are uh, suggested by Prop A on marijuana and reproductive rights. Mr. Mayor, when we first talked about this, when it was first ratified, you know, we, we talked about, uh, you know, your position on it. I know there were some things in there uh, that you were in favor of. Why did you decide to, to make a stance now? Well, so let me be clear. I am in favor and I've been very clear about uh, our support for women's reproductive rights. And in fact, we passed a resolution of the council uh, in support of that. But the changes uh, to restore those rights uh, happen at the state level. Um, and also with regard to legalization of marijuana, our, our court system, our DA have been making strides with regard to ensuring that there's alternative forms of justice. But in order to legalize marijuana, to decriminalize marijuana, that's a state and federal issue. That's not something that we can do at the city level, despite what Prop A is suggesting. Uh, and then again, when we go into the issues of uh, theft up to $750 and uh, property damage under $2,500, it's a real concern that there's a lack of consequences if Prop A would uh, be, be passed. Uh, ignoring the victims of crime, which are families, nonprofits, small businesses. And there are uh, ramifications of that we just can't support. So but when it comes to the issues of abortion, especially, you're saying that those problems are usually dealt with or those issues are usually doled out at the state level. That's not going to happen in Texas. Well, it will happen when people vote their values. And, you know, again, polling has shown that people support access to, to reproductive rights uh, for women, and uh, also that there is a need to update the laws on marijuana. Um, and people need to vote accordingly when they look at their state ballot and who they're putting into office that have authority over those laws. But again, uh, the, these issues cannot be solved at the local level, uh, as Prop A suggests. So, but cite and release is nothing new. I mean, San Antonio has mm -hmm. been doing that. The Bear County has been doing that. So that's something that's, that's sure. been happening. I, I, I'm trying to get a grasp because I know when I first asked you, you said, I'm not really going to take a position. There's things I like. There's things I don't like. Tonight, you're coming out and saying you are against well, Prop A. That, that's clear because, number one, what I said from the very start was that people need to read through Correct. what they're voting on. Remember, this petition was 11 pages long. Uh, when people go to the polls and they read through the Prop A prompt, it's going to be about two pages long. So there's a lot of stuff in there that go beyond the headlines of marijuana and abortion and reproductive rights. Uh, when you go down in the details, and hopefully, again, as I've suggested, people need to go and educate themselves on what they're voting on. I hope they join me in voting against it, because once they read what's in there, it's a lot more than those headline issues. With regard to site and release, we have a site and release program. Uh, this goes well beyond what was intended in prohibiting officers from making arrests, really a lack of consequences for uh, theft up to $750 and property damage up to $2,500. Who are the victims of those crimes? Small businesses, nonprofits, working families. And without consequences, uh, that's not what site and release 
was intended to do. Yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about. Thank you. Yeah. So, th- yeah. you know, let's talk about small businesses since you just brought that up. A lot of small businesses along the St. Mary Strip, we've been talking about this for months and months and months, have been very hurt by the construction delays and, and all of that. What's your position on that now? Because we do know that a lot of those businesses did apply for grants, anywhere from ten grand sure. to $35,000, but not all of them got it. That's right. So my position is what it has been, is we need to get those projects done as quickly as possible. This has dragged on way too long. I know traffic is beginning to open up uh, back on St. Mary's, and we, uh, the, the entire city council has supported uh, additional small business grants for those small businesses that have impacted, been impacted by not just COVID, but the one-two punch of COVID, then construction delays, construction costs. Uh, Those grants are are being distributed now. Part of that is to uh, ensure the grants are going to those businesses that have had a significant revenue loss. So those are are part of the eligibility criteria that were approved by the city council. But that relief is coming. Uh, It's being given out now uh, through the committee that uh, approved, uh, approved those grants. So we're doing everything we can to help support small businesses. And we also need to do what we can to avoid uh, unnecessary, uh, unintended consequences. Are you satisfied with the state of St. Mary's, the, the, the road right now that runs through a lot of these businesses in the Strip? Is this what you expected when you said, I'd like this done by late March, early April? Absolutely not. What I expect is that project get done. So anybody that's satisfied uh, with the project as it is, um, you know, I, I would say we're, we're not done until we, those orange cones are removed. Uh, so we need to get that project done as quickly as possible. I, I understand this is a process. There's a lot of work that needs to take place, underground utilities, um, you know, streets, sidewalk repair, the whole, the whole thing. It's a major reconstruction. So this is not easy work. Uh, but we want to get that whole project done. And so until that happens, uh, we're not going to be satisfied. Uh, but, but hopefully those orange cones will be removed. Uh, soon enough. And we will enjoy the fact that we finally got this project done because there's a lot of streets all over town that have suffered in disrepair with us um, not investing in those streets and, uh, you know, without these major reconstruction projects. So they need to get done. Uh, They will get done. And we won't be satisfied until they are done. Mr. Mayor, before we go, we do have about 15 seconds left. So if you could tell us, do you have another date now for when you think those projects are going to be done on the St. Mary Strip? I was, so I have not had a date, a new date given to me by the construction offices. Again, this is part of the operations of the city. Uh, but if we're looking for a new date on the additional construction that's remaining there, uh, I will certainly talk to the city manager and get that clarification. I know there's a lot on the agenda that's coming up with the San Antonio City Council in the next couple of days. Unfortunately, we're out of time. We will, of course, cover those over the next few days. But, Mayor, I always appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We'll be right back.